Welcome to Data Points, a podcast by InterSystems Learning Services. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Stitcher. You can do this by searching for Data Points and hitting that subscribe button. My name is Derek Robinson, and on today's episode, I'll chat with Luca Ravazzolo, Product Manager for Cloud and Containers at InterSystems, about Kubernetes. Welcome to episode two of Data Points by InterSystems Learning Services. My name is Derek Robinson. As you may have heard in episode one, we're excited about the launch of this podcast, and we've already released three episodes for you to check out. In this episode, I'll be talking Kubernetes with Luca Ravazzolo. Luca is a product manager here at InterSystems focused on the area of cloud and containers. He brings a ton of experience to the table. He celebrated 30 years at InterSystems this past fall. What you're going to hear about Kubernetes really builds off of the concept of using Docker containers. I'm sure we'll have episodes covering Docker concepts in the future, but for now, definitely browse our learning catalog for starter information about containers if you're interested in them. Kubernetes is one of these newer technologies that really allows you to take your container approach to the next level. Rather than diving into those details, I'll leave the real explanation to the expert. So here's my interview with Luca. Alrighty, so welcome to the podcast, Luca Ravazzolo, Product Manager for Cloud and Containers here at InterSystems. Luca, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Derek. How are you doing? Good, good. So uh, we're happy to have you on the podcast here today, and we're uh, going to be talking about a pretty cool, uh, fairly new cloud topic today, which is Kubernetes. So um, I know that you've done some stuff on this at our Global Summit and Inter- InterSystems here, yep. and uh, there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about. So yep. why don't we start with, for the new person, for someone who might not understand what this technology is, what is Kubernetes in, in, in brief? In brief, well, Kubernetes is a platform, first of all. Uh, what does that mean? It means that it is, it is a full um, a full suite of software, if you like, that holds that can hold up your application. Um, what does that mean in a little bit more details? Um, well, uh, it allows you to define uh, how your application is going to run. And uh, consider that uh, even cloud service providers, right, like uh, AWS, Amazon, right, and Google and, and Microsoft Azure, they all have an implementation of support Kubernetes. But why is that interesting? Well, because because of two factors. thing. One is that Kubernetes was born to make sure that your application runs all the time. That's its job. It keeps monitoring that all the workloads that you put up there actually running all the time. And, um, and if anything dies, we picks it up again, right? So it looks at your definition says that's what you want me to run. You want me to run your know, 32 instances of, of this app, app, and and if 31 are running now, well, he's going to pick that 30 second and make sure that it does run. Um, and the second second part of uh, the why in Kubernetes is interesting is because it allows you to define all the pieces of an application. If you, so, let me just say, if you have like the front end pages of an application, that's interesting, but it's only a part of it. You need some business logic behind, right? And if you have developer the business logic only, that's only a part of it. You need somewhere where to store the information, for example, of your uh, of the purchases that somebody is doing, right? Um, so you need a database on the back end. So and then um, if it's Black Friday, what do you do? Well, you need to make sure that it sustains the new mem- biggest and largest workload that you have. And so you need to dynamically, you know, um, um, create more web servers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Kubernetes can do all that, but not, not only that, it allows you to actually define all of those pieces, all those components, and even load balancers and web servers and DNS uh, engines inside inside this the platform itself. And so it really allows you to, to define the application, how the application has to run. And that's very powerful. We do not have anything like that in the, in the market right now. Yeah, that's really cool. So I think um, one of the, and we won't cover this in this episode, but one of the precursors to this technology is really understanding containers and Docker containers and kind of having that deployment, right? And so uh, me personally, I've worked with Docker containers a lot, but really right. only in my local environment, right? So it sounds yeah. like one of the biggest appeals of Kubernetes can be this really enterprise level deployment of containers and really when you're looking to do more like you just said if you have you know 30 instances of something or a bunch of load balancers and really mapping out the whole configuration of your application environment that uses containers is really the biggest 
advantage of Kubernetes, it sounds like. Absolutely. And you, hit, you really hit the, the, the nail there, right? So we all, we all have uh, worked with containers. They're, they're great for developers to just, you know, uh, get the code, uh, um, uh, configure up all the dependencies of, of your work, of your libraries that you need, run it on your laptop, and that's great. But what happens when you actually start defining an application, you know, as you said, where, where I need a lot more pieces around it? Uh, well, uh, w- there's a nice little tool that Docker built, which is called the Docker Compose. So you you can uh, work with multiple containers, but you're still confined and able to run those containers within one single machine, right? Uh, your laptop typically, or maybe a high-end server if you want to, to test some, some performance issues. Um, but what happens when you go to the cloud, when you go to a data center where you have, you know, um, uh, many, many no- nodes, man- many VMs, uh, many bare metal machines, and, and you need to, to scatter your, your workload across many of them so you can take advantage of uh, uh, of, of all the CPUs and all the memory that are available. Well, then you need to start installing, you know, things like, you know, uh, a network overlay layers, and then how, but how, how then you, do you deal, how do you know if those containers are running properly or not, etc. And that's what Kubernetes does for you. So it prepares those nodes, it, it, it creates this overlay network for you, it handles all, uh, literally everything that is to hand in terms, you know, networking and uh, D- DNS naming and all those complicated part. And that's why it's very powerful. One other strong characteristic, let me add, that just came to my mind, is that as you define your application uh, within the Kubernetes platform, that platform uh, and that definition is totally portable. So if you're working on AWS today and you got this YAML definition, I know you're looking at me strange, you know, YAML, <laughs> we, we, all, we all love to hate that, but you know, it works, right, for now. Um, so that same definition, you, you can bring it on site, on-prem, uh, maybe with some bare metal because you want, you know, uh, more performance. And that same definition will run there too with right. the Kubernetes platform orchestrating everything. And that's very, very powerful. So organization gets portability. They're not yeah. locked in to any cloud. And, and they get, uh, you know, a platform that manages their workload. That's yeah. very powerful. Right. Scaling up some of those benefits of containers like portability and efficiency that you can really do for a whole orchestrated environment there. Um so kind of taking everything you just sort of said, now moving into maybe a little uh, an example or two, what are some of, like, you know, as you've talked with either customers of Intersystems or just other people that you've seen in, at conferences or just in your networks, what are some of the coolest or maybe one or two cool use cases that you've seen where Kubernetes really helped to take someone's environment or, to, or application environment to the next level and really leverage all these things that you're talking about? Yeah, a, cu- a couple of examples that, that really spoke to me. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the uh, a couple of developers that started to work with it, and they said, this is great, you know, but I'm a full stack developer, and typically uh, I want to test it on, on, you know, on, on a medium size, you know, type of um, environment out there, with, you know, 6, 12 nodes. So the easiest thing is just to go on the cloud. So so they provision the infrastructure, and is, they say, well, uh, everything is in containers now, so uh, how do I do that? Well, the easiest thing was for them to just... Uh, um, uh, run a Kubernetes in, the, in the, the specific cloud, so GKE, for example, for, for Google, or EKS in AWS. And then all of a sudden, they have the possibility to just, to just really run the application, all the components, even components that they are not uh, develop themselves. They were just pulling container, you know, let's say, you know, a backend, a new version of the database with a new schema that the, the organization has just developed. And he has just developed, for example, you know, some, some new business logic. And, but he, he was just putting everything together on, on you know, several machines, several, several high-end machines. And he was really testing it through properly instead of just running either everything on his laptop or trying to configure everything himself manually. Just one single manual uh, YAML definition with everything um, configured and it was up and running in a few minutes. So that was, the, you know, the single developer that really wanted to to uh, to monitor and follow through the uh, the, the workload, uh, the data coming through, where it was going, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The other one was, was uh, um, um, another customer that they were very close to uh, to go in production with Kubernetes, and um, and they were just shocked that sometimes you know they left you know the the, the Kubernetes servers up and running, and then in the morning they come up and you know the system had fallen over. But they didn't know if they didn't go and have a look at the at the, yeah. at the logs. It fallen over. There was some problem. You know, one of the EC2 instances had 
died, uh, but the application was up and running. Right. And right. They, they were just shocked themselves. <laughs> you know, no pager, no, and no the, any of those things. Kubernetes makes sure that, you know, whatever you wanted up and running is up and running all the right. time. And that's part of his job. You know, this, this controller that keeps checking that everything else as consistent as your definition, yeah, which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, and, and I want to transition to a couple uh, last points about uh, how it relates to InterSystems Iris, but one thing before we move on, I just want to emphasize too that something you said at the end there, which is kind of that self-healing nature of Kubernetes is one of the bit, like I think you can't emphasize that enough as far as one of the advantages where that use case you come in and you didn't even realize something went wrong because it really has this ability to fix itself with some of those failovers and, and bringing up a new node in place of it. So I think it's a good thing to emphasize there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the self-healing part, it's, it's very powerful. And the other one, of course, is that you can auto-scale workload automatically. So you can set threshold and say, hey, Kubernetes, if, uh, you know, if these two particular nodes, you know, go above, you know, 90% CPU, right. for example, you know, are, you really need to, to do something for me. So spin up another another couple of these nodes, right. these, these services, and it can do that for you. So you can set these rules, uh, part of, of your application, so that, you know, when Black Friday comes, you just prepare, but you don't yeah. to panic right 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 exactly cool so uh so that's really exciting moving to kind of the last portion which is uh shifting it to our intersystems iris users that are listening right so right uh whether that's intersystems iris or even other intersystems t- uh, products that are older than iris and people might move to it what should people know about the ability and what iris is doing to work with kubernetes well, as you said earlier on, you know, it really is an orchestrator for, for containers. So by the mere fact that we have Iris in a container, um, you know, we're we are able, uh, we can run w- uh, within a Kubernetes cluster or, or orchestrator platform. Um, but there's more to that because things can be complicated to define just because I've got this little YAML uh, uh, template, uh, but I might want to put some rules. For example, I want to put some rules, some affinity rule that I want to run my Iris instance because it's very important to me as a as a backend database on that particular node that has 32 cores so you can put all these type of rules but then when you get into the specific semantics of intersystems areas like i want uh, for example a, a mirror pair well kubernetes doesn't know anything about our mirror pair or our acp communication and so what we've done is uh, uh, we, we built an intersystems kubernetes operator that allows you to define all these particular semantics that we have with our product and you just define in the kubernetes operator intersystems kubernetes operator Data, this, this particular topologies that you want to run and wham it just goes and configure everything for you and that's very powerful yeah yeah that's great um so lot, lots of stuff coming La- last question here uh just kind of taking a step back in general as you look forward you know with the possibilities with kubernetes what excites you the most about kind of the you know maybe what's untapped potential or really how you see this going forward into the future well, I think we're just at the beginning of it, right? If you look at the, uh, the GitHub repo uh, since 2015, when, uh, um, or was it 2014? Well, anyway, <laughs> a few years, few years back when, when Google released it, you know, uh, the Kubernetes uh, uh, ecosystem at Kubernetes, you know, even a Git, GitHub, you know, um, uh, site where where we have more, more than 300,000 people working on that it's it's really exciting yeah. and there are they they're divided even into sig- special interest groups so if you're interested you know p- people should go there and and participate and give opinion for storage security all kind of stuff i mean we're really talking at really high level here but yeah. it really is a full platform and and so i think what we're going to see in the future is a lot more uh, kubernetes managers just like some of the work that uh, AWS and Google and Azure have done and and a lot more automation a lot more uh, monitoring and uh, and a full ecosystem that allows you to really run even in a more automated way than it than it is now so I think we're just the beginning and the portability that, that it offers is just fantastic so that none of us locked into any, any specific solution yeah, exactly yeah. very exciting stuff so uh, Luca Revazillo thank you so much for joining us thank you Derek it's been a pleasure yeah see you soon Thanks again to Luca for sitting down with us and giving us some really interesting stuff there on Kubernetes. One little side note that might be helpful for those of you looking up content on Kubernetes, this is something that tripped me up a little bit when I was first researching it, is it's often stylized or abbreviated as K8S in written form. As far as I could tell, that's pretty simply swapping in an 8 for the 8 letters in the middle of the word Kubernetes between the K and the S. Works for me, but if anyone knows more reasoning behind that, leave some comments for us in the developer community to enlighten us on that abbreviation. So hopefully you enjoyed episode two in our conversation with Luca. 
Remember, make sure to find us on your favorite podcast app and subscribe so that you never miss an episode when it's released. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Data Points.